Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome to the WTFFF special series um, sponsored by HP and Z by HP. And you know what? This is really so exciting to get to talk to all these different people with such different backgrounds. Yeah, I really enjoyed this interview you're about to hear because really it is really in our special area of interest and in our, you know, education and, and career space of design related issues regarded to you know product design and development using 3d printing and all these cad tools that you know you need to use if you're going to you know be in this industry yeah so today we have bart massey and he is part of the hp gxd which is global experience design division uh, he's the design manager of the advanced design team he's a tech savvy visionary he's a creative director with a passion for driving innovation and shaping relevant expression and experiences and he's done this from around the world um he's from the netherlands and um and he's living out of vancouver right now and it's just so interesting to see how he He's looking at that sort of broader view of how you get all the different disciplines to work together, all the parts of the design and development process working together, and then how you get the tools and the resources together to really make it, to make it sing. Oh, well, that's a great way to put it. To, make to put it sing, soul Tracy. in it, as yeah, is what he talked about. put soul in it, and really it's about bringing the human element into design and working within a very large corporation like HP how you really focus on that complete experience, right? Right, and really how you get the value of the human in the design process when you've got all this technology and tools. Awesome, well, you know what? Let's go right to that interview and then we'll be back to have a few words after that. Bart, so glad to have you join us today. We're excited Absolutely. to talk design process. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you know, this is, it's, it's exciting for us to talk about technology and 3D printing and all these different things, but someone who gets us as designers, we're excited about that. Be yep, kindred spirits. That's right. So, you know, this is a design process and working in teams is a big challenge. So I was hoping we would kind of start there because, you know, we're having the challenge right now of working remotely and working with our team and trying to get things designed. And most people don't, I think, you know, that we got a lot of hobbyists and a lot of independents and they don't really realize how most major projects or uh, major products are all designed as a team. So right. how do you guys do that? Because you're, you're heading a, a big design team. Absolutely. I think that's a really good idea. And it, that also brings us to the opportunities that this uh, working from home uh, event kind of uh, brings us. I think you'll see a lot of trend speakers talk about how this might change that landscape, right? And I think one of the thing, the big topics that we talk about a lot, obviously, is the XR the ability with VR to bring us closer. So if we talk about product design and evaluation in XR to be in the same space together, using uh, VR is one of the huge opportunities that we're working on setting up right now with the teams. Apart from that, there, there are other tools as well, right? The online, um, online collaboration tools that we use. In some instances, I believe it is actually almost beneficial to have a neutral space and work in a, in a virtual space rather than a, than a shitty conference room, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Sometimes I actually feel that the tools that are provided with a mirror board are perhaps more powerful if you see all the different arrows moving around with the different people might bring more powerful in hyperspace than in actual physical life. Obviously, other times you have to be together in a space where you work on designs, you talk, talk about designs, talk about proportions, and you're, you're face to face. But I think we're lucky as a, as a profession to have the ability to do a lot in virtual space, I think. That's what we're noticing. There's, a, there's still some building and, and physical building that we need to do. So we, as HP Design, we live on the, the brink between the physical and the digital. That's actually the heart of what we, what we are and where we live with print and with 3D print. So I think in that sense for us, it's, uh, we're lucky they have the ability to do a lot in, in hyperspace, I guess. Well, Bart, you know, in particular, I mean, I know from managing a team of designers myself and then, you know, being a designer that designers are 
a lot of times have sort of an anti-authority streak in them and maybe <laughs> don't really conform very well yes. to the corporate, I that. In, I corporate that. environment, right? Yes. So uh, while I agree, you know, collaboration is critical in design and development and uh, especially, you know, critiquing each other's work, being open to that. I'm a big believer that, you know, two heads are better than one, and, you know, and, and seeing past your own blind spots. But yep. I do think designers tend to thrive more if at times they're able to do their own thing and be in their own environment. So I imagine the current situation yes. is actually not hurting the design and development process much. True, true. However, there are two sides to this coin, right? I mean, um, one of my favorite books is Skunk Works, is the, um, you know, the development of the, the, I think it was the Blackbird S71, you know, those airplanes. They take a team completely offside and do Skunk Works. Like advanced design is all about that. And then there's, you know, Apple sometimes does does the same as a reference as they have a separate building for the Macintosh back in the day, right? I mean, right. where HP, yeah. we... And we so sometimes HP some groups have sprints, right? So that's also another version of it in sort of the right. now of software days, so... Yeah, but the, absolutely. And what I was, I was going to mention is the other side to the coin is one of the biggest roles that we have in the corporation is to influence the course and the direction of the company towards customer-centric, fitting things that people design cherish centric. And design centric <laughs> but also that the influence of the culture shift of for instance taking big teams of r d and market having the dialogue with marketing so in that sense i think you're right there's this moment when we need to be producing and provoking creating provocative design that is um, that is building on the subconscious needs of customers and not just the rational math of oh here we go here are the features you know, what is the real thing that people let, love and latch on to? But then you have to influence the, the, the R&D organization and work with them closely to bring it to market. So I think there's, there's a little bit of that too, where you have to be there and you have to be together. Yeah, and that's my role usually in the in what we do. So I completely understand how that is. Like I don't want to have I don't want to be out of touch with those parts of the organization because the buy-in is so important to a successful launch of any product. Yes, well, true. And actually, I am off, especially well. I've I've only worked in other corporate organizations a few times, and even I only would last so long there before I have to get out. But I also played a role in trying to protect the designers and make yeah. the environment and the situation yeah. the best for them to produce their best work. And then I would sort of be that buffer between the corporation and them. And yeah. being a designer, I think, was critical because you have to understand all that. So I, I think that I really feel for uh, how you, how, some of how you work. That's a good point. Well, so Bart, I've been thinking about sort of the design process and it's changes over time. Like, I mean, it's really changed a lot. And I think some of what frustrated us early on when we were starting 3D printing and doing other things is it felt like a lot less design and a lot more technicians started to come into the job. How is what you're doing and uh, what you're doing with HP and how you guys are always looking at the process of, of designing and of producing and doing all of those things? How are you starting to address and help remove some of that technician job so we can live in that world of creativity? I think it's a good point. And uh, that's one of the points we addressed in a, we, we created kind of a provocative mission vision statement on how, um, for instance, computational design is going to change the landscape. So using algorithms mm -hmm. in the design process. I think the bigger vision there might be that what is the real value of human in the design process? If you start analyzing this, uh, one of the biggest things in the middle of it is that we that we breathe. It's hard for me to pronounce because I'm Dutch. We breathe soul into matter. Oh, so, you did so fine. It's, <laughs> it's the, the breathing is the hard part, right? But so breathing soul into an object. I mean, you can perfectly make by using rational equations, you can come to very okay products that are not very, uh, you know, it's not something you would actually cherish to have or to use. So what the designer's biggest role is to bring the humanity and the soul and the desirability. We often talk about critical to desirability, quality and desirability. Those are at the heart of what we can bring to the equation to elevate the value. And I think as you, what we're discussing right now is with computational design and bringing in algorithms, the part of the actual thing you're discussing, which is the, 
which is the actual craft of the tinkering and the creating and the, and you call it almost like a technician role ideally the designer's role is more elevated to a dj so orchestrating dialing and the system is more could almost be more artificial intelligence a computational design so if you could code a design language not just for digital but also for physical we could we're, we're now discussing how can we code our actual physical language into a dna that could just be tinkered with and it's quite a provocative statement but then as designers you can elevate yourself to what are what is the real purpose and value of design group and it, that's actually always the dynamic that you see in organizations we go up and up and up to find the real treasure and then the tinkering the technician stuff that you're talking about like managing the 3d printer on your desk and spending days with bringing bringing this thing come alive those types of things should ideally all be automated right in 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 a, in a cup in a decade from now so it's this kind of automation to free ourselves up to the to do the real important things that matter and where we can really bring bring a difference yeah you know Boy, I do we yeah <laughs> agree with what you're saying there you know i always entirely. think about so tom created this 3d print tie which everyone on, on wtfff has seen you may not have seen it yet bart will be happy to show it to you after but yeah, yeah. but you know he created this beautiful 3d print tie but in and and it was gorgeous in rendering right it's beautiful on the screen but then going to print it he actually had to create a whole new language of support system and everything because to get the printer to print it yeah and that yeah. always seemed to me as like such a frustrating That's part the of the design part right about. Yeah. yeah and so like it's like i have this vision but it won't make it if i don't develop this other thing you know yeah. and uh, and then that's all technical and yeah. loving the idea of of the computers and and the computational, computational design getting yeah. smarter to I be able so. to just let us do what we want to do and it does all this it it supports that right it's 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 a big shift because for me i i provocatively could state you know industrial design is very 1900 you know what i mean it's 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 the it's the it's a century ago and people still say oh yeah you're an industrial designer or whatever it's an insult to many designers because we look end to end everybody looks end to end the good thing with industrial designers is they're a little bit like the fighter pilots they actually fly the plane they actually make the stuff and and a lot of uh, other designers are actually creating value in a completely different way but actual just industrial to be labeled industrial designer in an organization and be put in a corner is actually quite frustrating yes. so everybody should say we're ux we're all experienced designers and but the, the people who do do industrial design understand the craft of that tinkering and they they own it and they're really good at bringing an idea to matter to to into form and to matter and they're the ones that um that actually make it come alive so having some of those skills is extremely valuable automating those skills into the future will allow more people to do the craft there and there's still some basic rules you need to learn about proportion minimalism you know what is the what is the global form language that we that we apply because uh, it's a global language, right? So I've so been lucky we, how do here, we progress Bart? that language? Sorry? Yeah, I've been lucky here because we have a shorthand for having to work together so long. So I can visualize something and go, hey, can we do this? And Tom would be like, okay, let me figure out how to do it. So I've been lucky that I have that as a part of my process. But don't call we him have a technician. That. Don't yeah. call him a technician. No, no, not he's at got, all. He's going to get really mad. No, no, no. He figures out how to bring form to, to my idea, right? And so I'm lucky in that process, but no, so many aren't, right? Like you have the idea, but it, you can't get it out. Yes. And you can't get yes. it through that process. So I get that. And I'm excited about that idea of that future. Yeah, you could think you could talk about the democratization of manufacturing with 3D printing, right? Every town, every village, every everybody can, can have a little factory in their home. But there's also maybe the democratization of the actual creating art by to a high standard instead of tooling something for $100,000. You now have the ability to do, I still think we don't we have our brain hasn't been able to grasp what we can do with 3D printing yet. Our brain oh is Oh my still, gosh, I so agree. 20 <laughs> years behind we're like oh we need computational design to actually make the most out of it because we're still talking about this stupid tool design which is like this this is what we can do, like this, right? This is what yeah, we do. You're only 1900. So it's it's so we're 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 still catching up but the ability to, what we can do with these tools nobody I mean it, we talk about growing products like like nature, you know, you literally can grow stuff. Sure. Di different materials, uh, embedding electronics or even power sources, printing power sources is not a secret, right? So imagine you can just print an entire product completely ready, 
ready for diagnostics in the field that you can do a test in 50 minutes in Africa that normally would take two weeks in the lab. That, that's the democratization. And then that product disappears and, 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 and is biodegradable and disappears in two weeks. You know, that's the future of, and we have, we have not been able to make the shift. I think you need a new generation of designers to understand what the possibilities are. Yeah, and then I agree you with have, you on that generational thing. And we were talking about that on some of our other shows Trying to here. catch up, right? Right. right. <laughs> we were talking about mega trends and some of the other things and we were talking about those. And in context, that's exactly where we were going is that it, it the reason this shift is going to take so long for us is because we almost have to re-educate in a different way, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or or the new generation stands up that ignores everything. It's like my daughter, eight years old daughter, who puts on the the the, the wireless, and the Quest is, uh, you know, she puts it on, and she accepts it as the norm. So for her, yeah. playing in vacation simulator for an hour with a friend in Portland is the norm. She's this is how she's growing up. I mean, we grew up with, you know, over there the, the Atari. <laughs> That's what yeah. my dad gave me, and I've we've seen the whole, you know coding development from back in the day coding basics to now so but what Juliet will grow up with is blows the mind right she accepts this vr space as the normal i mean it's that generation is going to be like what do you know what are you talking about gravity sketch of course i mean i've already and they've already made some stuff in gravity sketch you know so it's, yeah they do they see it as the normal and not only that but they have a a greater acceptance of voice recognition and ai and other things it's just being a normal part of their yeah. daily basis yeah. i we look at our our five almost six-year-old and she could tell alexa what to do before she could write or right. read, you know, right. so that, that, that their thought process is going to alter everything that we do. In and, the and actually her, her attitude or her expectation, you know, she sees her older sister using a computer. She's like, well, when can I get a computer? Well, you need to learn to read first. Yeah. You know? But maybe I mean, she that's doesn't. What, that's maybe well, we're the ones who are wrong yeah, about that, the, right? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You believe, we believe the culture of books and education is still valid. I mean, I tell my kids is that, when you're 18, you can go either go into the Navy and get a college <laughs> free education, or you go to YouTube and you just learn whatever you want. But that's, that's right. a I'm a bad parent, but I want no, them no, to go we, to college. No, no, we do the same thing. I want so. them to go to college, but you know what I mean? No, I we, we, we do. Understand. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about how some of the different technologies are now facilitating the product development process because I think it needs eye-opening to some of us who are still a little old school, all the different things that we have at our access to be able to use. Yeah, I think uh, what we're what we're trying to push is very much the um, efficiency through um, VR, using a VR space. For instance, as an organization, we might spend a few, maybe 100,000 or more, or a few hundred thousand on model making, right? So hard models, and these are big machines. And they cost a lot of money. They're made in in uh, very high quality model making shops. Those guys, you know, a lot of stuff's handmade. It's CNC'd, finished, perfectly beautiful things. And then you see what you see is what you get. Why? Because we order a tool that's like a million dollars worth of tooling. So you need to see it. And our in in real life review of proportions that are sometimes millimeters, like five millimeters. For I'm talking industrial design, of course here. Uh, we know is, what you're talking about in furniture. We've done it. If you don't see it in person, you, you, you know, don't know if it's going to work, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, however, the the cost reduction or cost efficiency of if you could only do half of that in VR, bingo, right? You're already you can buy I don't know how many HPZ rigs, the, the the fastest one with the reverb for that money. I mean, if you save twenty thousand dollars, you can you know. So that's the equation we're making now. And what are the tools we're using them practically to go and do that? I think there's a variety of things. Gravity Sketch collaboration is going to come out soon. We have a link with those guys already. So using Gravity Sketch to be in a space together to block out things works pretty well. I've done it myself. You can really create almost like a retail space and just block it out together and mm -hmm. talk about it. Uh, the beta of collaboration, more people in one space is coming out. So that those types of tools. Then there's Keyshot VR, which is you just basically press the button and you're in a VR space where at a, I think a 90 frames per second CMF is, is, is good. It's a good representation of what it is. It's obviously not ray traced because you can't do that at 90 frames a second, but it's good to really observe and view proportion and things like that. It's a click of a button. And then next to that, I dived in Unity quite heavily because my it's my view that gaming design tools, because what we talked about earlier, the ability to switch to more complex forms of modeling for 3D printing needs, needs us to ditch old fashioned CAD and go into 
game development can't because you have a ZBrush, you have you have uh, Blender 2.8, which is huge. So the, the whole ability to go into polygon modeling with UV mapping means you can print in color. So what you make now, so all your gaming characters could be coming out of the uh, jet fusion oh, machine imagine in color. that. <clears throat> but as, we talk about that all the time here, that it's like old industrial design model is like do it in gray, right. add color later. And I and, come from the color background going, no, they're intertwined. If you want to yeah. design a great product, you better have your color figured out from True. the beginning, right? But but if you talk about the pure, let's so let's just go back a little bit to the industrial design process. So how we would do that for printers would probably be, um, so I created Unity Scenes where you where you download a Unity environment. There's this company ArcVis, and you go to the asset store in Unity, and they make these insanely gorgeous, very modern, progressive houses. Like you have this uh, a Mies van der Rohe house. It's all it's all baked textures. You you get in, and you're you're blown away because it's very high quality material. So what I do then is you grab any Rhino model, you drop it in there, and then you go in there and you and you observe it how it looks in a modern office. So we talk to those guys, and they can also create special spaces for us, so we can make a factory to put a 3D printer in, for instance, and observe it. So that's the kind of stuff we're doing with Unity. Now that's so if, as far as industrial design process, I think we'll be able to observe proportion and do design reviews in VR at a larger scale. And I think we're, the only reason we're slow is because we're so busy that it's, it takes effort to, to switch and to adapt, to get the machines and to get the rigs, and then get Singapore to work with uh, Vancouver in the same space, at the same time, and getting people in workshops. That's, that's, that's the near-term goal. We're, li we're a little behind the curve there, but I think it's a great way also to demonstrate our, all our machines, right? So we have rigs set up and we're doing it. Now the the color part comes in when you when I keep talking about the gaming world and if you look at the gaming world there are like billions of characters right the gaming characters in full color uh, that are out there and um, Xbox or you know uh, we're we're have a collaboration with Valve by the way so HP is bringing a new uh, headset with Valve so you, mm. the, the gaming giant they just brought out Half Life so Half Life and so HP Valve is a collaboration that's coming to coming out with a with a headset but imagine now if you can unlock the world of the gaming characters of fortnite characters that you downloaded and you can have them printed in full color that's where the real money is you know it's no longer <laughs> the real the real money is in gaming right i mean there's billions of of, of go dollars going around in skins and stuff like that so when i talk about color printing i think that will be un unleashing the funnel of printing there will be phenomenal i'm mixing in a lot of things here in, in one uh, very lengthy answer so no it's a fantastic clarify. answer and those are all great resources those are great resources people yeah. need to know about and understand and how, how things are accomplished today you know and in a meaningful way uh, where really the the goal of all these tools right is to have a, a seamless flowing process from our mind's eye of what it should be and what the yes. user experience should be to creating the product and technology tools have always been limitations and interrupting the process don't you think there, there's an interesting comment that we have in our hpz presentation about that is that i use examples like this for instance i don't know if you can see it on the camera but, but sure. check this out right? oh yeah Beautiful. look at that so the reason i pull this up is because it's so you see the metal and wood is crafted by hand right and if I if I compare it to my my letterman here, which is just stamped and formed and is not comfortable, this thing is hundred. I don't know. This could be a hundred years old, and it feels it has the warmth. So, what it also means is that the machine has dictated this form. So the machine that has been used in the shop has literally dictated this shape. Right? You, there's a guy holding it against the the grain into. And in that sense, we talk about so the tools changing, the toolbox changing to computational will change the form language of the structure as well, like the bicycle that's designed like a bone, right? Like a human bone. Right. Now we had Kolani in the last century doing this stuff, like a probably a century ahead of his time, you know, a Swiss guy that made these kind of organic stuff. And I'm not, I'm not seeing organic form language as the answer, but you do see it in structures and things like that. But the essence of this is that the tool you use completely changes the landscape of of the outcome and of the form and of them so i think in that sense we'll see 
a big shift going on in lighter, more efficient, less material use, you know, a frame that is calculated, optimized. You know, so optimally. Well, that's, so, that's where the AI really comes into play, right? And that's right. where I think some of the advantage of AI is, is that uh, hopefully the data the AI is, you know, that's feeding the AI is accurate. And that's one issue. But let's assume that it is. Right. You know, you really don't have to you know, guess or make assumptions so much about how much material is going to meet the needs, you know, like the classic examples of some of the buildings in New York City are way overbuilt, you know, structurally, right, for what was needed. And, you know, like, what was it, the Empire State Building, a, a plane in the 40s, like flew into it, uh, accidentally, like a World War Two B-17 bomber or something okay. flew into it. And it crashed it went into it but the building very much intact and because it was way overbuilt for materials it's like a mountain almost yeah right so i mean <clears throat> that that's to me some of the advantage but if i if we let the ai and machine learning do the design work then you know the engineering i think is fine but the design work then well we're, and, we're, and we we're have losing to, something yeah right big. when i very my one of the very first sort of i'm going to call it lectures that i attended when we started into the 3d print world and we were really going out to trade shows and other things was this one by autodesk and they were showing off how amazing you know the underwater rov design that was much more efficient as water goes through right. and i thought okay great there's no person in that you want it to be efficient it's doing all these things that's a really smart use of it and yeah. then they show what uh the computer would generate to make an airplane and i look and i i turn to tom and i go that's when a human being needs to step in and said people are going to be too afraid to sit in that plane like we have to as you you know as understanding human nature it's as true. designers true. step but in and say that's great now let's put a skin on it before people flip out right but <laughs> I, wa I wanted to know because one of the crazy stats that i remember from elon musk is it, it's also an con accepted consumer belief that a human should do it because they're better because one of his stats and this is not a fun one was that i think one in 100 million miles uh, of a normal car 90 million miles of a normal car is one death on traffic and the tesla autonomous was already at 120 million miles per one death and going up exponentially the thing is with these innovations they go up exponentially just like COVID. so even though you might not see the curve yet at a certain moment that car will will never have an accident it's be like 500 million miles so you know what i mean the the, the computer power of the exponential Im improvements of learning are such that we cannot keep up. That's what they always That's talk right. about with the, you know, I signed up for the letter of artificial intelligence, you know, that you can sign up on the life.org with Elon Musk, Stephen Hawkins, everybody signed up for this letter that says, we need to make sure AI remains safe. We need to invest in uh, artificial intelligent code to book in code that makes it safe and protecting humans. It's almost like the law of Asimov, right? The third law. Right. And there's a whole institute where all the, all those people signed it. I went in and I signed it. If you read a lot about it, it's not just the beginning of artificial intelligence, but the exponential explosion of what they call artificial super intelligence. And when that happens, we're ants. We're just going to be monkeys. You know, we're like left behind. But what you're talking about is so can, can the humans still trust what the machine has done that it's better well, for and us. I think well, also it's I think just, a good topic. yeah it's a I think it's also an understanding of and this is something we talk about on the show a lot but also just in general and the way that we design and what we personally do our job and our role as industrial designers because we make consumer products that are near term right these are not things that are 20 years out or 10 years out they're coming out in six right. months right? right our job is to create that bridging between what we see today and what we want tomorrow and help to create uh, help to create the minds gap for human beings true. to accept it right true. true true i think a big part of our job there is the expression of the function the expression of how to use it i mean that's those are all yeah. the things you do it Again, I think if you automate it and you do it right, that again the computer could probably be better at it than us. I agree. However, the however, the question is, can they breathe soul into something? That's right. right. That we we only know what poetry, you know, it right. cannot write poetry because it'll be meaningless. So I think there are are to actually harness our role in that process as the value of humanity and poetry. And passion and love again is you get back to John Lennon or whatever, but it's <laughs> that's the essence. And the computer can never 
and shall never replace it but it will liberate us that's what the books about you know the rise of the robotics you know about the economy economy of artificial intelligence that's what the core of that message is about is that our role will be elevated we'll have more time will it be if we do it right it'll be an utopia we'll make better stuff you know what i mean it's the optimist view of that equation yeah well you know it's so interesting that you say that because and you and you mentioned covid briefly what we were seeing is a lot of our 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 friends and and colleagues in the in various industries struggling and whether they're in design or they're in uh, editing in of uh, TV and video and other right. things like that, right? We're we're seeing them all struggle with the with the process themselves once they leave the office. Like, how do I render? How do I how do I do this so that I'm yeah. not creating a a time crunch for myself of having now not enough computing power, not enough on my own yeah. single right. machine? I was thinking of Liam Lawyer. Yeah, we have a friend who edits video for television. And he has this problem of remote video editing using VPN for the more powerful machines. Now you have similar needs with your team and Correct. rendering, Correct. Uh, I think, the visualization part of design and Correct. have some really great tools of these rendering farms to achieve that in a rapid way, isn't that right? Yes. Correct. Yeah. So that's that's the power of the cloud, indeed. And there, there. So their systems. HP is launching a similar system where we can use insane brain power or, or GPU, CPU power, to basically what we do is we go with Keyshot with their biggest rendering. Imagine you have a whole range of like it's literally like I think somebody mentioned the other day the new record is a 15 gigabyte Keyshot file. Now that's blows wow. the mind, right? Because it's tessellated polygon. So normally that would, would be Jeff Hayden from Keyshot will go, you guys are nuts, but th this is a print. It's kind of hard to ship all, to, to strip all the contents out of it. And because you always lose bits and then you render it and there's like black holes, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you, so this is like a lineup of 15 of these machines. And what we do then sometimes, or, or with the files that can be uh, shipped over the cloud is they go to the render farms and then you have a whole list. It's kind of cool. You see the, you see everybody there who's shipping stuff and it's like just processing, processing, lightning speed. It's things you can do in minutes that otherwise would take on your desktop. You had to queue them up for an overnighter and you know what happens. You come back the next day and it's like, no, that's not right. So you, you find the fail, problem, fail. right? I know, it's it's I know. literally like instant, instant now, limited only by the bandwidth of you shipping that file to the farm or to the, to the remote access tool. So that's liberating designers. And uh, yeah, HP uh, also offers a lot of that stuff uh, for use and for testing outside. So yeah, that's, that's powerful stuff. Well, you know, I just, I love that idea of being a much more integrated in the process. So integrative design in that, in that sort of general, and that we're starting to look at experience design. We, you know, we always talk about this is our job is to make sure that we're always speaking on the role of the user right? Or the consumer or whoever that might be. Yeah. And we're, we're really trying to play that fine line between trying to push the innovation envelope and then making sure that we have this, this voice of the user. Do I understand it? Do I get it? Yeah. Will I buy it? Right. I mean, all of those things are our role and job. And it is hard yeah. to do that when you're concerned with like, well, I better make a really small file so that this prints really fast so I can get onto the next thing. Right. It, it really constrains you. And so now this yeah. starts to open that up. I it love that. It really does. Because yeah. I mean, I remember having to only render a portion of a product I was designing. And while that can be effective in some situations, it's really not ideal because you're right. not evaluating the entire thing. True, right? true. I mean, in the last last few years, Keyshot and good, powerful uh, HPZ or, or rigs, is it's, it's insane. The, the, sometimes the presentations, we had one yesterday from Sync guys in Singapore. You, it's just so beautiful, the HDRI lighting of the details. And it just, it's its actually better than a photo. It has this quality that's just high. You, you could never put it in a studio and get that level out of it. So it, yeah, that's really powerful stuff, yeah. You know, the, the, the last thing before we go that I really just want to touch on and really talk about is this sort of idea we touched on early on. It's like, what really does need to change and how we train our designers and how we, we uh, you know, also hire in our employee side of things and how we 
really sort of make this future go faster, right? You know, getting them tools, get them trained. I mean, you were talking about getting your team all the VR gig and all the all the stuff that they need. Right. And how do you get them all to buy in and do that? Like that that's a challenging job as a manager as well. That's true, but um yeah, that's a, that's a big topic. I think it is self-motivated for people with the passion will find the tools. What I found simply the democratization is another difficult tongue twister there, for, but um, of learning through YouTube, for instance. So for, we do train people, you know, we have specific trainings. We did a grasshopper training a couple of years ago. It's a computational design for Rhino. And then you'll see always the dynamic of it's a fairly high bar, you know, something like that. It's a very specific tool. So few will pick it up. Not everybody will be able to have the time to dive in. But with, um, so I do a lot of just learning uh, in the evenings on YouTube. I, all I do is spend time on YouTube. I had a look at podcasts. So I love podcasts. Uh, I, I listen to hours of podcasts, just people chatting uh, about various topics or um, Bracky's learning. So I, I learned Unity by just looking at endless YouTube videos of Brackies. And then if you want to learn Blender 2.8, you just go to the guy who does the donut. Um, I forgot his name right now, but there's this guy from Australia. He's, he's the owner of Polygon, which is a textures website. Have a look. It's really cool. They have like all these texture tools and insane woods and ceramics. And this guy, I think it's Andrew Price actually, is known for, if you want to learn Blender, you dive in Andrew Price's to donut tutorial. You learn how to render, build and render a donut with glaze on it and beautifully render it in Blender. But the bottom line is you, you go in with these tutorials and within a week, boom, you know, you know the basics of Blender. So I think the democratization of learning is the power that is available to all. And, there, and the, the, the biggest thing that I find really exciting right now is the ability to connect with the developers of software. So not only can you shape the hardware side by you know, designing stuff for HP, uh, but also the software side. So working with the, you, you, you can get in touch with the, with the CEO of Gravity Sketch and he'll send you a list of questions. I mean, blows the mind, you can help shape the tools for the trade by just having that dialogue you know there's a fairly close dialogue with the guys from rhino you know whatever so it's it's, it's amazing that you can actually tinker and influence the, so the, so it uh, sounds to me like we really have to hire and get and get in continuous learners people who value the the learning process in and of themselves who are always looking to continuously improve their own you're like that you absolutely will dive into anything and learn and figure out it when figure it out and and there nothing go, yeah. seems out of reach right so the, i think we have to do that and then i think really the, what we're discovering here and i think you see this too bart that the power of what you guys are doing at hp is demonstrating that power of collaboration with other organizations who are deep experts in various things. Yeah. I yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah we do. Uh, I do quite a few models at the m modules with students at the moment. So we're having one running with the University of Auburn that's been running for three months. So we do Zoom classes and we do lectures and then they present their brilliant ideas to us. So we get inspired as well. And then tomorrow there's an initiative of a university around COVID. So they're organizing the student activities to come up with solutions around COVID. And we've been asked to join and we're joining as, as uh, coaches and collaborators and, and, and consultants to say, to help them through creating these um, innovations to battle COVID or to get people protected and things like that. So connected with the outside world. In that the sense. true power of getting designers together to solve problems. I love that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bart, this has just been really fascinating. Is there anything that you'd like to, to leave our audience with, things that you'd like them to think about, things that you want to share with us? Uh, no, I'm just super excited about this this wave of, of opportunity and technology. That's I think there's a huge paradigm shift happening with with moving into this XR world, AR world, and, and also the blending of gaming design tools with the old-fashioned industrial design tools. I'm super excited about that whole dynamic. And I think uh, that's where we kind of are at, at uh, this moment in time. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it was thank a you. pleasure. Absolutely. Mutual. Thank you very much.
Wow. You know, this is so eye-opening to me, Tom, that we think about these, the way to hire, we were just talking about that at the very end of the interview, the way to hire and the types of people. And, you know, I think that's really why we've been successful is like, we never really stopped learning new things. Like we were always adopting new technologies and bringing them in. It's how 3D print came into our lives, right? We're like, okay, this is an inefficient way to do it is using these model makers. Let's do this. But we didn't abandon it. This is what I think is really important to you is when you're looking at the efficiencies of adopting new tools, if it's really not a replacing something with something better, you don't do it. So we didn't always replace creating 3D, mo 3D print models. We never did that of our big furniture pieces because it was really inefficient, was really time consuming, took longer than it would for us to have our model shops in Asia create them for us. So, it, you know, it wasn't there yet. Maybe it's, you know, VR would do that. XR could do well, that for yeah. us now. We wouldn't have to, right? So, Maybe. but we were always looking for how can we be efficient and which tool is ready for what we need? Because, you know, most designers, and this is what I think Bart intimately understood and was really expressing, is like, it's great to adopt cool new tools, but if they're not like making something more cost effective, efficient, like taking out $100,000 spent on model making and actually allowing you to make more iterations and changes than you were in the, pro in the previous process. Like looking at that, it's like we have to look at the technology and tools and saying, are they really ready for us yet? Doesn't mean we uh, say they'll never be ready, right? We have to look back at them all the time. Well, and then it has to improve the process in some way. It's either got to reduce the amount of time spent, the amount of money spent, or create a better outcome for the product in some way and or free you up to be more creative right <laughs> right and and that's not always the case with you know a new tool or you know maybe there's a learning curve with a new tool and you you have to have some personal inefficiency to be able to get up to speed and be able to do it but you know i i really can see how he has his eye on the ball you know? well, yeah, you know, this is what I, I'm loving about what we're learning about, about all the members of the HP team, but Bart Massey really expresses this in, um, to the nth degree, is really this power of collaboration between technology and the, the designer, between designers and their teams between all of that. I just love the idea of this, you know, cross collaboration, working to build a better ecosystem overall of tools, people, processes. And it, it is quite an ecosystem. I'm actually really jealous of, of the render farms they have and, and the fact that they can be distributed in their, each designer in their homes, doing their work on their local computer and then when they print it, it goes into the cloud and is rendered and, and allows them to keep working on something else and, and let the major horsepower of the render farm produce it. I remember having a render farm locally within one of the companies that I worked with more than a decade ago, really. And that was very helpful then. This is is a quantum leap above that. Quantum leap above that, yeah. And so, you know, we have some things that um, we're going to be keep mentioning throughout there that um, calls to action, some things for you to test out and try. And we have one today that I think is, is fun. And we didn't really talk about it today in great detail. We'll talk about it, I'm sure, at another time. But it, it, it adds into this sort of idea of being able to create boosts and, 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 uh, I'm going to call it productivity increases within within um, within your tool sets. So uh, Z Central Remote Boost 2020 software has a free 90 day download. So you can go to the blog post at 3dstartpoint.com. You can go to 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP and you'll actually have all of the calls to action, all of the different things that they're offering for you to be able to test out and try out and have to check them out and see there's videos about how they work and then there's also of course the links to being able to download them and try them and and you know get their offers going but i think it's really cool and i you know that they give such a nice long trial window which you need because yes. you have to figure whenever you're trying out these new tools i think this is so important that you have enough time not only to understand the tool itself but understand how to integrate it into your design process like we talked today Right. So I agree with you, Tracy. 30 days, you know, a lot of times that these software trials will give you 30 days. And, and quite honestly, I don't, I never think that's enough time. No. So I was really happy to see that with this special offer, you get 90 days to work with it. That's really a, 
an ample amount of time to try it out and, and, you know, prove that it's going to work for you. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll be talking more about some of these tools and other things as integrated into other episodes. So you may have heard about it ahead of time. You may hear about it afterwards, depending on when this episode actually airs. So anyway, I hope you guys have been enjoying this experience as much as we have of just sort of exploring some of our older episodes and refreshing them and coming up with that, why they're still relevant today. And then interspersing these new people we're being exposed to and these new case studies of how far 3D print has been coming in the last six years since we started this podcast. Oh my gosh. And, and hopefully you've seen by now, I mean, I've been feeling it. It really has come a long way. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm still using desktop 3D printers. We're using them here in our business every day and certainly every week. And it's very valuable. But there's so many new things going on here with what HP is doing. And, you know, they're renewed whole, energy for oh us here, gosh. I and, think. <laughs> well, and, and great advances in the results, what you can produce with the, you know, with their process. Sometimes it takes taking a step back and then looking back again and, and seeing how far things come in a year. Yeah, I'm so glad we've been doing this. So anyway, you guys are going to want to stay tuned to the rest of the series. We've got some more great episodes coming up for you. Um, and we're really excited that you joined us here. So thank you so much for listening. And as always, we have all of the resource for you at 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP. It has this entire series documented for you. So you'll be able to uh, go there as well and listen to it in its entirety. Thank you so much for listening. I'm so proud to be back here with you all. Um, I'm Tracy Hazard. And I'm Tom Hazard, and you've been listening to WTFFF. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.